Rebecca, Parent Teacher Association, let's talk about the teacher connection here too and what you are hearing. Um, how are teachers faring right now? Teachers have had just an incredible burden over this last 18 months. I mean, if you think about it, teachers go into the profession because of their passion for kids and education, and their whole world was flipped upside down. And teachers had their own family issues to deal with on top of trying to figure out how to reach all these kids that often they had never met before. Mm. Um, you know, I had a sixth grader last year. He didn't step foot onto his middle school campus until April. Um, you know, so it's, I, I, I really feel for the teachers, but I see there is that mix of excitement and also nervousness. And obviously for teachers in Nevada, one of the biggest challenges is we talk about the fact that the pandemic's not done, we're back to universal masking, but we typically have 35 and 40 kids in a classroom. That's mm -hmm. not unusual. One of my son's seventh grade English classes had 42 kids in a class. I walked in on open house night and I could barely move in that room um, because there were so many desks. So this idea of we still need to be social distancing both teachers and parents are saying, how is that humanly possible with so many kids going back into buildings? So it's like those on the video said, it's this mix of we want our kids in person, we want to have that connection and understand, but at the same time, there are still some real serious health concerns that in Nevada, because our class sizes are the largest in the nation, and we don't have the funding to fix that overnight, we don't have the teachers to fix that overnight with a 700 teacher shortage, yeah. you know, there, there is that just unfortunate mix of both excitement and anxiety about how the next couple weeks are gonna go. Yeah. April, I wanna come to you. Let, let's, let's, let's not just talk about the immediacy, but let's acknowledge the immediacy uh, we're talking about here, but what some of these indicators are, and now let's look at maybe uh, real reform over the next few years. And I go back to what you said, there's a lot of federal funding that's on mm -hmm. the table here. 777 million of American Rescue Plan money can be used here. Um, you know, overcrowded classrooms, learning loss, two big pieces right here, some of the technological gaps that we've mm -hmm. seen. What are some of the areas that you see that are really raising to the top um, where that money could and should be used? Over this past summer, um, CCSD, and I think all the school districts did a summer acceleration program. It was this idea that since students got back into the classroom in like March or April, that, and then the school year ended shortly after that, that they wanted more uh, social emotional learning and more interaction with teachers. Um, so, so they had summer programming where students came into the class and um, you know, provided daycare essentially for younger kids, but also um, more learning opportunities. And that not only helped with learning loss, but also just helped with that sense of community, right? And building that back after we've lost so much. And those programs were sort of universally loved, it seemed like, um, not only from teachers who enjoyed getting paid extra because we know we have underpaid teachers, but also from the students and also from the families. And so there is talk of, Excel, of, of ex extending those mm -hmm. into future years. I think we have about three years to use these funds so we can see that for the next two summers doing that sort of programming. And that's the kind of thing I think that families will really love and are really pushing. And I've heard from a lot of people that they would really love that. Other areas that um, the money could be used for, I and mean, there's a wide variety, but um, people, there's a big push to try and get teacher recruiting because like Rebecca said, we have these huge classrooms and you know we have a teacher who's, a high school teacher is interacting with 200 plus students a day. That's, <laughs> that's a lot. And, it, and it's a public health concern at this point. So maybe using some of those money, some of that money to fund teacher recruitment and whatever it takes to get more teachers into our classrooms, um, that could be a beneficial thing. But again, this is a conversation that's ongoing, so we don't know yet what the, the state and what the d individual districts with their pots of money will do, but it'll, it'll be fun to watch. It is an ongoing conversation, and, and Tammy, Tammy, I want to come to you. Uh, one a big part of this large conversation is getting community input mm -hmm. and getting community input from organizations like communities and schools. When you look at this big pot of money and you're looking at the 57 schools that communities and schools is serving, where would you like to see some of that money go? We are really focusing on mental health and social emotional. Mm. Um, before the pandemic, six out of every 10 of our public school children in Nevada qualified for free and reduced lunch, which 
essentially means that they live in poverty. And that was before the pandemic. And so we really have to focus on what are the needs of all of our students and meet those students where they are. And a lot of our kids um, really come to school and, and, and rely on school for something more than um, the academic piece of it. Um, so we really are focusing on what is that social emotional piece? What is that trauma informed care piece? And so um, all of the districts I know are really focusing on that as well. Um, I know CCSD added the Lifeline program last year, which has been tremendously successful. We'd love to see the expansion of that. We'd love to see more social workers on campuses, more community health workers, more communities and schools team members, more counselors, um, really focusing on how do we wrap our kids with this um, bubble wrap and really kind of help them um, and support them in all the areas of their world, I think would be extremely beneficial. Um, again, um, you know, our kids need that additional support and need that caring adult in their lives. And as Rebecca said, when you have teachers that do amazing jobs that have 42 kids in their classroom, there's no way that they could possibly identify every different nuance or every different situation that a child is going through. And if, if, if Johnny is, is acting out in class, Four, three or four times during the week, um, we need to have a, different, a conversation with Johnny about maybe what's going on in his world that is different than he's just acting out. Mm -hmm. So, and the only way to be able to do that is to be able to put more of those people in the classroom so the teacher can refer Johnny, not to a, a dean or not to somebody to, to reprimand him, but to say, hey, what's going on? And, and, and ask those questions. That is what we're gonna be able to need to do in terms of continuing to create you know, move Nevada further along the continuum and, um, you know, really focus on education as a whole, a really a holistic approach. A holistic approach. And I want to bring parents into this conversation too. Of course, parents have been affected by uh, COVID on many fronts here. Um, and let's talk about parents' mental health and how important that is to the equation. Um, and that parents are also getting the right mental and wellness care. Unfortunately, in our community, we know that there aren't enough mental health providers, um, that it's hard to get into a pediatric mental health provider or even sometimes as an adult. Um, and definitely, if you talk to any parent over the last 18 months, they'll probably say, I survived <laughs> distance learning and I only had one or two breakdowns a day or I only wanted to throw the computer out four or five times a week. Um, and so I think it is a reality that we have to recognize that it isn't just kids, it isn't just teachers. Our whole community has really gone through an extended traumatic event. And like April was talking about earlier, we spent the last 18 months firefighting. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I used to work for the Red Cross and when you're in a disaster mode, you're hyped up and you're in response mode, but you have to figure out how to come out of that and function again. Mm -hmm. um, and Nevada is a unique community because we, a lot of us are transplants. A lot of us don't have extended families. Our kids don't necessarily have grandma and grandpa's house to go to like they would maybe in another state. And so I think we need to recognize not just a whole child approach, but that and what communities and schools does very well is recognize that you have to look at the family as a, as a whole unit and how can we support that. Yeah. And I, I would just add one thing that we also need to recognize that schools can't be the only solution for this. <laughs> we keep adding things mm -hmm. onto schools because it is a great place to get kids connected to resources. It is an easy place to make sure kids are served. But a lot of these needs are community-based needs mm -hmm. that schools shouldn't be asked to solve by themselves. And schools, that's one reason why it is so hard sometimes to have enough money to meet all the needs because schools keep getting asked to do more and more without extra support from the community. Yeah, and we should mention that there is a lot more American Rescue Plan funding, as April mentioned, that is not just going to the district, mm -hmm. but going to the state and the municipal levels too. Uh, April, I wanted to come to you and let's talk more about this equity conversation mm -hmm. too. Um, h historically, uh, it is low and moderate income families that are the slowest to recover from any form of recession. We seem to have a very booming recovery right now, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the same for low and moderate income families and students right here. What are some of the biggest concerns here, some of the biggest gaps you think we're going to be seeing here in the next couple of years? You know, um, like you said, the recovery, there's a lot of economists who are talking about a K-shaped recovery, right? So the people who are already doing pretty well, they're recovering faster. And then the people who weren't doing so well, they're getting even worse. So it, it looks like a K. And um, what 
it, it'll be interesting to see what kind of policies could change to make things better, right? Like Rebecca um, has just said, schools can't be the only thing that, um, they, can, they can't be the only solution. And they constantly are in our society here in Nevada and probably in the country. But, um, you know, there's a lot of talk here in Nevada about uh, minimum wage and sort of labor issues, making things better, diversifying the economy. All of those things are conversations that need to happen and that should happen. And once those happen, education will get better. Education is often seen as the solution to a problem, but a lot of the time I see it as a symptom of larger problems in our society. So what we do with our billions of dollars from uh, the federal government, what we invest in at this time, whether or not it's early childhood, um, early childhood and daycare for so to put families back to work so that they don't have that issue, um, whether or not it's healthcare issues. We've done some healthcare policy here in the state. If that helps people be healthier, then <laughs> that'll help children. Um, mm -hmm. If their parents are healthy, all of those things um, have an impact. So I think that we, we do have to look at it holistically from a whole state level and a whole policy level. And I think, it, well, go ahead. Tammy, no, no, please, go ahead. I was ahead. going go to just say, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, and one of the things that we have to look at, again, you know, before COVID, many of our schools had chronic absenteeism rates of 30 to 40 percent, which means that in any given day, 30 to 40 percent of the kids were not in school. And if you're not in school, you, you, can't, you can't learn. And then if you're not in school for multiple days, you would then have to catch up. And, and this is before the pandemic. And we know then coming out of virtual learning, many of our students had to stay home mm -hmm. um, and couldn't log on because they had to um, take care of some of their younger siblings because their essential worker parents had to get back to work and they didn't, weren't able to drop them. And we've, you mentioned the daycare situation. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's a whole other issue. So when we're talking about this community, I mean, when at communities and schools, we do everything we possibly can to wrap our kids, but it is a community approach. We have to look at our housing and, and that's, yes. a, that's a huge housing, challenge. Yes. And as I mentioned, if 30% or 40% of our kiddos are not in school because, there is a, um, because they are home insecure and they have to move back and forth and then they have to go from school to school, um, it takes them many months to get back up to speed. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a big issue that we need to look at in the state um, because that is going to affect our kids and the way in which that they show up every single day and the way in which that they um, may or may not stay in school. Yeah, absolutely. Just as one one example, the, the tech divide, of course, is another example here. Oh. And mm -hmm. I wanted to bring one thing uh, into this, too, is we, we saw some policy changes on grades that came out from the board level here. Um, and absences, absenteeism, uh, you know, assignments that aren't being uh, turned in aren't going to impact grades as much. Do you think that brings more equitable balance to a lot of the children that are underserved and might be kind of in this transient type of situation here? You know, I do. I think it's important for us to to analyze where our students are and 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 the different um, the different um, places that our schools are. There are many schools that have you know really great teachers and 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 all the all the all the tools that they need. And then there are other schools that are still struggling. And we mentioned there's a teacher shortage. They're still struggling. It's it's hard to find teachers that maybe want to work in in different schools or they may transfer out. And so I really think we have to really analyze where Nevada is. Um, but also meet our kids where they are. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it.